Good morning and welcome to Worship at Greendale People's Church. We are so grateful and thankful that you have joined us this morning and thank you for welcoming us into your hearts as well as into your homes. To all of the mothers and grandmothers and to everyone who one way or another nourishes, nurtures and mothers another, happy Mother's Day. Today, during our worship service, we will celebrate an open communion, which means whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on your life or spiritual journey, you are invited and welcome to join in this great feast. So I encourage you to take a moment, go and gather up some crackers, muffins, bread, bagel, toast, some juice, coffee, tea, whatever you have on hand, have it close by so when we bless and consecrate these elements, we may all share in this great feast together. Let us now take a moment to center ourselves and prepare ourselves for worship as we listen to this beautiful opening prelude. Shining 
Good morning. In celebration of all who, one way or another, nurture, strengthen, and mother us, we invite you to join in our responsive reading. Mothers come in many different forms, and today we celebrate them all. Thank God for mothers. Everyone here is either a son or a daughter. Thank God for mothers. For those women who have joined God in heaven and whom we miss dearly here on earth. Thank God for the mothers of the past. For every woman who is working day and night to rear her children right now. Thank God for the mothers of today. And for all the women who are expecting but aren't quite mothers yet. Thank God for soon to be mothers. For the women who took in others' children through adoption and foster care. Thank God for the mothers with hearts so big. For those women who have lost a child to death and must carry on. Thank God for the mothers who are so strong. And for all the mothers who have desperately wanted to have a ch child of their own, but chose instead to mother everyone else. Thank God for the mothers in spirit. We thank you, God, for the women who have influenced our lives in so many ways. We pray that we will honor them in everything we do. Amen. Amen. Please join in our opening song. We are a people who believe in the power of prayer. We believe that prayer changes us as well as that God listens and hears and responds to our prayers in ways that we could never hope for or imagine. I encourage you at this time to, to share your prayers, the things for which you are grateful and thankful for, as well as the individuals and the circumstances that hang heavy upon your heart this morning. If you're watching us on Facebook Live, you can share your prayers in the chat on the, the side of the screen as, as you watch us. Or you can go to our website and you'll find that there's a place where you can share your prayers at any time during the week. You can also send a message to our care ministry, care ministry at greendalepeopleschurch.org. Let us know what you're praying for and or if there are things that you need. This time we of course, hold in our hearts all of those who are ill, who are grieved, sick, mourning today. We give thanks as we have been throughout this epidemic, this pandemic, for all of the healthcare workers and the frontline workers, for the retail workers and the truck drivers and the people who are risking their own health and safety in order to continue to make our lives richer, more helpful, and more safe as well. For all those who are feeling more isolated and more alone at this time, for everybody who's getting antsy, 
being home and not able to connect into the social networks that they usually are able to participate in. We give thanks for each and every one of you who continue to make our community vibrant and meaningful, keeping the food pantry stocked and continuing to reach out and make phone calls and send emails and connect with all of the people in our community and city who are feeling even more isolated and disconnected. Let us join together then in the spirit of prayer. Creator God, we come to you on this incredible day that you have made. We give you thanks for our mothers and grandmothers and all of the women throughout our faith tradition, our history, and our lives who have made our lives so meaningful and so wonderful and so great. We give you thanks for the love that we find in moms and grandmoms, in, in all of the people within our families and friends and even in strangers, in whose love and care for us we feel the kind of love that you have for each one of us, knowing that we are your children, beautifully and wonderfully made. So we come celebrating the great gifts of all of creation, the love that you have for each one of us. We also come with open hearts, knowing that there are those within our community who are struggling, people who are feeling lost and alone and isolated, people who are having financial difficulties, those who have lost their jobs, who are trying to make their rent or keep shelter, provide food for their family. Creator God, we ask that each and every one of us feel your loving presence within our lives, that we are assured that one way or another that you are continuing to provide for us and guide for us and help us together to use the gifts that we have in order to support one another so that each of your children may feel that there is a way being made even when we feel that there is no way. We ask at this time that all those who are grieving, who are struggling with illnesses of the mind, the body, and the spirit, those who are facing uncertainties, that they feel your loving presence, that they feel the power and the healing presence of your Holy Spirit, lifting them up, guiding them, and carrying them forward that in small ways you give us courage to use our gifts and our presence to nurture one another, to touch all those who feel disconnected so that we all feel the expressions of your love. We know, Heavenly Creator, that you hear our prayers because you came to us in the one, your Son. And so now we pause in a moment of silence that you may hear the prayers that are written on our hearts. Creator God, we lift up all of these prayers to you, knowing that you hear us when we pray, whether those prayers are spoken or unspoken, because you came to us in the one, your son, Jesus, who is the Christ, who taught us this prayer while he was here with us together. This prayer that we now say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the power and the glory and the kingdom forever and ever amen the first reading is from genesis chapter 1 verses 26 to 28 from the inclusive bible then god said let us make humankind in our image, to be like us. Let them be stewards of the fish in the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, the wild animals, and everything that crawls on the ground. Humankind was created in God, as God's reflection. In the divine image God created them. Female and male, God made them. God blessed them and said, 
Bear fruit, increase your numbers and fill the earth, and be responsible for it. Watch over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all the living things on the earth. The second reading is from Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 through 24 from the Inclusive Bible. You've heard that our ancestors were told, no killing, and every murderer will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that everyone who is angry with a sister or brother is subject to judgment. Anyone who says to a sister or brother, I spit in your face, will be subject to the Sanhedrin. And anyone who vilifies them with name calling will be subject to the fires of Gehenna. If you bring your gift to the altar and then remember, and then remember that your sister or brother has a grudge against you, leave your gift there at the altar. Go to be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. Thanks be to God. Whoever you are, wherever you find yourself on your life or spiritual journey, I want to assure you that anger is not the problem. We all experience anger one way or another at some time or another. Maybe now in this time that we're living through, maybe more so than at others, but one way or another we all experience anger. It may be that time when you're driving down the highway and all of a sudden at the last minute somebody comes from the left side of you and cuts across you in order to get to the exit rather than slowing down, turning on a signal. Or maybe more recently, it could be that time when you were in line at the grocery store and somebody pierced the six foot bubble of safety surrounding you. Or that time when you saw somebody go into the grocery store with a mask half on, not covering over their nose, their mouth, or any of it, trying to adhere to the letter of the law, but not the spirit of it, and making everyone safe. Anger is a very real emotion, a very human emotion. It is part of who we are, and it is there because it tells us something. Tells us about those times when our experience of the world doesn't match with who we feel we are or who we're called to be. We are each created in the image of God. That is the commitment. In the beginning, from the beginning, there in the early book of Genesis, we find everybody, male and female, all are created in the image of God, created in order to be a reflection of who God is and, and how God works within the world, in order to be love and in order to be light. And from time to time, things just don't work out that way. God gets angry. After hearing his people cry for 400 years of being enslaved by others, God gets angry. That's what raising up Moses to confront powerful Pharaoh and all of those, the, the, those challenges that they face are all about. Remember, set my people free. Moses gets angry. Remember, Moses is the one who meets God up on the mountain, who receives the Ten Commandments, one of which includes, thou shalt not kill, incidentally. But early on in Moses' life story, there is an incident. He was raised in the house of Pharaoh, even though he was a Hebrew, but he had to keep his identity secret. As he grew up, and he was experiencing the horrible, harsh treatment of his cousins and sisters and brothers. He felt growing frustration, inner angst, hurt, and anger. One day, it all erupts. He sees somebody, a taskmaster, who's beating up on a couple of the Hebrews, and he's had enough. And violently, he takes the other's life. And then he runs away and he hides out in the wilderness for 40 years, which is where God will find him there. Burning bush, commandment to go, Moses, confront Pharaoh, 
and face down your fears in order to set my people free. Jesus gets angry. Remember that scene there in, outside the temple with the money changers? Jesus gets angry, turns the table over, throws the money changers out. Why? Because they've put barriers up that made it hard for the most vulnerable to enter in to God's most holy places. Anger is not the problem. But what then is this all about? Well, according to Steve Slozny, Dr. Steve Slozny, who is a psychiatrist and an author and contributes regularly to psychology today, he says that anger is a secondary emotion, that anger is really an indicator that something deep within our core is hurting, and that anger is there as an indicator for us to listen to. Only too often we are so angry, so frustrated, so out of touch with our own reality that we're not willing to listen deeply to what our own anger is telling us about ourselves. He says, oftentimes anger is, is triggered because we're made to feel less than who we think we are, we're made to feel vulnerable, we are, are, are disrespected, feel powerless, feel lost, alone, hopeless. Which, if you think about it, is precisely where I think Jesus enters in. Remember, <clears throat> he begins his ministry preaching the good news that God's kingdom has come near, the time of God's love reigning in compassion, ruling in the spirit of healing and hope being resurrected within our lives and in our times comes near. And then he gathers up his disciples and look at what he does and look at who he gathers. Is it not the very kinds of people who have experienced the kind of disempowerment, and disenfranchisement, and hopelessness that triggers all kinds of anger because of our fear? First, he reassures them, God has already blessed you. And then he tells them that each and every one of them and each and every one of us have a purpose, clarifies who and what he is all about. And then he begins to show them what love really looks like in the way that we act with ourselves and one another. That is what life and love is all about. And he begins saying, look, you've heard it said, don't murder another. I tell you that to hold anger against a brother or a sister or some other that that is the same and equivalent as killing the life of another. Why? Because we were made for relationship. We were made to be in relationship that has four different dimensions. And when any one of those dimensions is out of line, then our lives are out of line. Frustration builds and anger follows. That's what he says. Think about it. He says, so if you find yourself and you're actually heading up to the altar and you have an offering and you're about to leave that in order to make your life right with God, put it down if you think that there's somebody who has a grudge against you or I argue you have a grunge, grudge and are holding on to something against another. Put it down and go and make things right. You see, the people of his day would understand what he's actually talking about coming to the off altar and, 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 and releasing your offering. It wasn't just about providing financial support for the ministries of the church. In ancient times, in Jesus' time, if people had, had broken their vows or their relationship, if people were out of relationship with God or with another, if they had broken any one of the commandments, the way that they got right was that they would go to the temple and they would sacrifice this thing or another. They would bring something that caused them financial challenge and hardship because they were giving of their resources in order to try to make their relationship right with God. 
And what Jesus says is just absolutely amazing. Jesus says, don't try to make your relationship right with God if you haven't done the hard work of making your relationship right with others. You see, anger is like a little seed, and if we do not deal with that anger, it will grow and grow and grow and grow. Some people actually argue that depression, depression in many ways, comes not just because of our brain chemistry that may be out of sync, but, but depression often comes because we have some sort of deep inner hurt that we have not yet dealt with, some sort of a loss that we have not yet grieved, and we don't know how to deal with it. Name the anger, address the issue, and go and try to seek reconciliation with yourself, with your sister, with your brother, with some other. That's what Jesus is trying to tell us, that it isn't about being angry. We all get angry. It's what are we going to do with that anger? Anger can become the motivation that helps us to realize that the way the world is is not the way that God has called it to be. Anger can become the motivation for us to actually find our own power. When you are feeling hopelessness and powerlessness and powerless, anger can be the motivating factor for you to take a step back and say, okay, I may not be able to solve world hunger and I may not be able to boil the ocean, but there's something that I can do within my circle of influence and in using my presence and my power to live the way I believe God has created our relationships in the world to be. So anger is not the problem. But when we hold on to that anger, when we hold on to our hurts and our resentments, it's like anger over time ends up becoming the armor that we use in order to excuse a whole bunch of attitudes and assumptions and behaviors that we hold and perpetrate upon ourselves and upon others. Because God is the God of love, because we are created in the image of God, we are made in order to be in relationship, and those relationships that we are called into are made to be loving. It is who Jesus is and what Jesus is all about and what every single part of his life and death and resurrection story is meant to show us. That God's way is the way of love, not the way of fear. That for us to enter into the kingdom, it means that we have to deal with all of the things that we are holding on to against ourselves and against others and how we are broken within relationship within our creator as well. But it's about living these relationships in harmony, in alignment. That's why Jesus says, you know, don't, don't try to make yourself right with God. Because if you're out of alignment with your sister or brother, then that's nothing more than a performance. So do your work. What is it right now that, 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 that the way the world has changed that you've yet to start grieving? Remember, anger is actually the second step in the grieving process. And right now, we all are grieving a whole bunch of different things. We're grieving the loss of birthdays and celebrations and Mother's Days that we cannot be physically together with one another. We are all grieving the loss of hugs and handshakes and smiles in the simplest things of life. We are all living in this perpetual time of not knowing how to keep myself or my loved ones safe, of not knowing when is this physical distancing time going to end? When can we get back together? When can I be with my loved ones and with my friends? We all have things that we are grieving. We need to acknowledge it and name it and say it. And remember, the first step of the grief process is denial. It's like, oh yeah, someday it's all going to end and all of a sudden everything's going to be back together just the way it was. That ship has sailed things will change for, for the foreseeable future. When we start coming back together again, it's gonna look radically different. And as I said before, that's not necessarily a bad thing because our world has been so filled with fear, so filled with violence, so filled with anger that this is the time for us to live life differently. 
So what is it about the world that we want to create? And what is it about the things that we need to dismiss and let go of? But let's not deny that the world has changed and that we have the power to change the world with it. Second step of grief is anger. So what is it about the way the world used to be, about the things that you can't do, that, that somehow is hurting you so incredibly deeply? Name it. Do your work. Say a prayer. Write a journal. Look deep within yourself and remind yourself that you already have everything that you already need because God created you as love and light empowered you in order to be a loving presence, in order to change our community, our city, and our world the way that God needs it and means it to be. Bargaining is the third step of grief. It's kind of what we're seeing right now. Well, I don't necessarily need to be six feet away or maybe I only wear my mask once in a while, or, you know, it'll be fine when the temperatures rise and, you know, we can all crowd into that beach or into that pub j just for a little while. Bargaining gives way to depression. Sadness. The reality that no matter how angry I may be, no matter how violent I may act, that I cannot control this uncontrollable thing. That I do have power, but I have to choose to use it in new ways. All the things that I've bargained, that bargain we find out is nothing more than a compromise and doesn't actually lead to a new reality. Which brings us to the final step of grief, which is acceptance to accept the way the world is and to accept that we are made to create the world the way that God has created and calls us to make it be. You have power. You have hope. You have voices if we choose to use them. And what Jesus is all about is trying to encourage his followers and us alike to use those voices not as part of angry noise, trying to promote all of our own anger and fear and violence and frustration, but to use our voices as God's voice of love and light and hope once more. May God continue to guide you. May God continue to bless you. May we find the grace to be present in new ways with one another. To hold each other virtually, if not physically. To walk with one another through these dark and uncertain and valley times. To empower, encourage, and to embolden each other that we may be who it is that God is calling us and blessing us, and has already created us to be. If you find yourself facing struggles, I encourage you to seek help online through a therapist. Dial in to one of our, our conversation sessions throughout the week. Text me. Give me a call. Send a message to careministry at gpc.org. There is no reason for you to be alone in this time. And we all need somebody just to talk to. And we as a community can be exactly that. Ears to hear, hearts to love, shoulders to lean on, and hands open wide, embracing the God who is embracing us as we embrace one another in this time through this time together. Let us go. Let us be the gift that God is giving to ourselves and to the world. Let go of the blame and the shame you may have for yourself or for one another. Take this time to pick up the phone or send an email or call somebody who maybe you've been holding a grudge against or maybe you feel maybe having a grudge against you. Let us be love. Love 
made real in extraordinary, profound ways as we truly learn to love one another. Amen.
Immediately following our 10 o'clock broadcast of our worship service this morning, I invite you to join us in our virtual coffee time, coffee fellowship. It is going to be hosted on Zoom. That information is available in the electronic version of the worship bulletin, which you can find on our website. We will also post the, the connection information into the chat if you're watching us on Facebook Live. Next Sunday, May 17th, during our virtual coffee time, we are going to have a very special presentation. It is an update about where we are on our transformational journey and all of the important work that has been happening even in this time when we are physically separated. Team TLC is going to be bringing forward a draft vision that they would like you to respond to as well as ultimately approve. The pastoral search team is going to be updating you about where we are in our search and completion of that important profile of the congregation and the board is going to be updating you about um, where we are on the journey, where we see our future actually heading and um, important ways that you can continue to participate in co-creating the future that God is laying out before us. We would like to say thank you to everybody who continues to volunteer at our food pantry, everybody who continues to bring much needed food to the food pantry, especially on Wednesdays between nine and noon, you can drop it off or you can contact um, the church office or send us an email and we will make arrangements to collect that food um, or arrangements for you to drop it off at the food when, um, when we may be at the church. And for everybody who continues to give during this time, thank you for your donations. Your donations continue to strengthen our congregation and keep our ministries alive and vibrant helping to make sure that we have care teams that are able to connect to, to people through um, Zoom and, and through phone calls, that the food pantry stays open, that we're able to continue to provide important and meaningful worship and continue to, to make sure that our facilities um, are safe and maintained so when we can meet physically again, those facilities are available. You can donate um, to the church if you, if you are able to, um, which we do encourage you to do so. You can do that online if you go to our, our, our website, greendalepeopleschurch.org. Um, there's a tab for giving. You can give through PayPal there. You can mail checks to the church at Greendale People's Church, 25 Francis Street in Worcester, Massachusetts. Or you can stop by and you'll find that the mailbox, which is near the entrance on the Francis Street side of the building, there's a slot where you can drop your um, envelopes uh, into uh, the mail slot. So thank you again to everybody who gives in, in so many different ways. And um, we are so grateful for, for continuing to have faith in this incredible, vital, important ministry. If you have joined us late in the worship service or you didn't have a chance to do so, I do encourage you at this moment to get your crackers, your bread, juice, coffee, tea, whatever you have on hand. In a moment, we're going to be blessing all of these different elements and um, important to have them close by so that we may celebrate this great feast of Thanksgiving together. While people go and do that. I'd like to just pause for a moment. The window that's behind us is a, an important window. It's one of the featured windows within our sanctuary at 25 Frank, Francis Street in Worcester. The window is unique because it depicts seven of the matriarchs, women who were so important and vital to our faith story. They are women who are featured in the Old Testament, people like Deborah and Rebecca and Rachel and Sarah and Miriam. They are people in whose faith in God helped the people and help us to continue to move forward. It's interesting and unique that within early in our 125 year history, that the people of Greendale People's Church, when we built the sanctuary, took the time to not only celebrate the stories of Jesus, which you'll find in other of the important windows within our sanctuary, 
or to celebrate the patriarchs, the fathers of the faith, and there's a window that celebrates them. But early on, in the late 1800s, in the early 1900s, that Greendale People's Church commissioned a window to celebrate the women of faith is just incredibly powerful in a testament to the unconventional, inclusive nature of our community. As we join together and celebrate this great feast of thanksgiving and forgiveness, we bring together into our memories the spirit of all of the women in our lives, our mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers and great-great-great-great-grandmothers and all of the women of faith who have helped to make our journey so much richer because they were part of our lives. Let us then join together and prepare to celebrate this feast of great thanksgiving. May God be with you. Let us lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is always right to give God thanks and praise, for we remember that even on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he gave thanks to God, blessed it, broke it open, and said, take and eat, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then, in a like manner, after the meal, he took the cup, he blessed it, he again gave thanks to God, and then he passed it to all who were there, everyone who was there, those who had betrayed him, those who were about to deny him, those who I have to imagine, who were angry for what he was or wasn't, what he may have said or didn't say, what he was about to do or didn't do, those who felt that he was about to leave and it was too soon and they weren't ready, those who were grieving the loss of the world the way they thought it should be, the way they had hoped it could be. And he said to each and every one who is there, take and drink, all of you, for this cup contains the new covenant, the new covenant which flows in and through my blood. It is given and shed and poured out for forgiveness for each and every one of you. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. For me, whenever we gather, in our lives, in our living rooms, in coffee shops, wherever it is, whenever we bring forward and extend God's grace and love, whenever we make time in order to forgive those who we need to forgive or to seek out forgiveness, we remember God in Christ into our lives, and I believe that God in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit becomes real in presence with us, in us, and through us once more. Creator God, we ask that you bless all of these different elements of communion that we have gathered around our tables. May you connect us as you connect them and transform us as you have transformed them, that we too may become your one body, many diverse members, sometimes separate, but all working together in order to extend your grace and your love and your forgiveness from within our hearts and through our lives out into your world. Amen. My friends, then, let us take, eat, and drink, and do this in remembrance of God in Christ. Creator God, thank you for gathering us around this great feast of thanksgiving once more. Thank you for all of the ways that you have nourished us. 
continue to work in us and transform us as you have transformed the grain of the field and the grape of the vine. Transform us that we too may become your nourishment to heal your hurting world. We ask all these things in your many names. Amen. Let us join now in our closing song.
Thank you again for taking the time to join us for worship this morning. To all those who are celebrating Mother's Day, we wish you a very happy, joyous, wonderful Mother's Day today. And to all of us, as we prepare to move back out into the world, may you remember that God is with you, that God loves you and blesses you, is there to provide and guide for you, that God is calling to each and every one of us to be God's arms of hope extended, God's heart of compassion broken open for the world, for us in very tangible, meaningful ways to be God's grace embodied and made real. May you find the courage to be God's loving presence, extending and expressing grace and forgiveness to all those you meet. Let us go, freed to be God's loving presence in this world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm.